Welcome back, everybody, to the harbor. I'm your host, the Kino Cowboy. I'm here with old Scott. We're hanging out, chilling, talking. Uh, two cis hetero males talking about a very powerful and important historical trans film, uh, Funeral Parade of Roses, Japanese yeah. New Wave. E- uh, even even that it gets calling it a trans film or a gay film or anything. The lines are very blurred. And, yes. and which is part of the point. Um, but yeah. also our terminology was not as developed, especially in the late sixties, which imagining this getting released in the late sixties anywhere. So in awesome. Is so insane to me. That's why it blew it, my mind back. Yeah. Now, so. I was, cause I didn't even know this was a, a queer film or LGBT or whatever the fuck you want to call it. Um, film. We can call it a gay boy film. Gay like in the movie. <laughs> the, the, all the subtitles say gay boys. I think that's the name of the subculture, though, no, it, they, that it was totally, definitely a term. Yeah, it was a term, kind of like Lady Boy with uh trans people in Thailand and all the kind of Yeah, it's a little worse like, with sex work. It's like, yeah, it's it's not the same. I'm I'm not saying it is, but uh, no, it, it's or even the idea that like I remember way back when we did uh Tokyo Godfathers, we mentioned that great movie Satoshi Khan. Um, oh yeah, we talked about all that in one of our Christmas episodes. We didn't do a full episode on it. But yeah, yeah. It's one more... day I would like to do a Satoshi Khan cast. I would love to because there's still a couple of his I'm, I've been saving. You know, saving for later. All I have is Paranoia Agent. I still yeah. haven't seen it. But... Um, but we talked about in that film. There's one who they cross dress in that. And sometimes they call that character gay or the F word slur uh, and stuff. And it it becomes that question of like, well, is this a trans person who is effectively identifying as a different gender than they were assigned at birth? Or is this just a gay man in drag playing with the idea of gender and sexuality via performance, um, but not actually you know subscribing or ascribing or whatever the word is being that gender you know that's this whole movie um it's all gray area and people forget why it's in black and white (laughs) i don't understand why so many people forget how gray sexuality and identity can be but it's like people are trying to make trans identity black and white these days um no matter what side I, I see it from every angle and it's like um especially now like uh i've noticed at drag shows if you talk about this person uh when they're not this character everyone uses f- woman female pronouns as if they're trans and i'm like well wait a minute i don't know if this person identifies as Right, because then that's disrespectful in another way. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Character. Just because they're a drag queen doesn't mean that they're trans. Like, that's disrespectful, I think, to both sides of the... I don't know, and it's like... Right, because you're, you're, you're minimizing the struggle of the actual trans person, and then you're weirdly, like, placing a struggle, that struggle, on somebody who doesn't have it. Because they're because yeah, um, there's plenty of just gay guys who like to dress up in drag or straight guys dress. or straight guys shit. It's not there's there's deal, guys like, who just like wearing dresses. I've just noticed that in more quote unquote progressive communities, when I've gone out, I've been to plenty of drag shows. I like drag shows; they're very fun. Yeah, I didn't know that. But uh, the last time, uh, last time one of the drag queens like did a cartwheel on one of the tables at Fastlers at the bar and like. Pulled down half of the Christmas lights with her <laughs> heel, dude. And everyone was like, holy shit. That's hilarious. I it was I really funny. That. And she played it off well, but like, it was one of the most amazing things I had seen. Like, my mouth like dropped and I felt bad the whole rest of the night. But like, it's hilarious. Because it, uh, it wasn't their lights, it was the bar's lights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just wrecking this. Uh... German style bar yeah but uh but that that is one of the interesting things is I feel like there's been a need to label everything yeah and for a while it became about breaking away from labels and it's like well we need to label everything again although it's not heteronormative labels and you do have where of the here's the thing 
I have talked to homosexuals or gay. I, I think homosexuals offensive now. I don't fucking know. But who even they get tired with the like LGBTQIA plus like the length of that and the amount of labels. Yeah, exactly. Which is a, a lot of times I just say queer is a catch all counterproductive. And even even that's a kind of, it, you know imperfect way. But the, it, it is interesting though because I've seen like with the increase of labeling it's almost you restrict things and you fragment things in a way by definition and there's a point where you're like well when when is it useful so i guess i wish i could draw a venn diagram here you can do that in post but <laughs> you can have some terms that encompass a lot and then you have subterms for specific things that may or may not encompass multiple things and that's just how language works we're getting into an incredibly semantic argument but but it is an interesting thing point is Things are gray and things are gay. And like this movie, it's both. Yeah. Um, I first watched this movie when it had its 40th anniversary restoration in 2017. And that's when it started buzzing around film circles again. Because um, we'll get into Japanese wave in a second. But like, I just want to say thanks to restorations lately. Because that's how they pop up again in a lot of film circles. Uh, biggest example is come and see uh round round uh peak pandemic i think everyone in film circles were like you have to watch this movie dude and yeah. um, do you feel bad because of this pandemic then watch this movie <laughs> no it was just like that happened to be the time i i just placed it because it was like around 2020 right. no 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 and um and uh, it was such like um like such a classic film now so many people put that in like their top 50 fucking movies of all time and i just feel bad for filmmakers who feel like their film has been forgotten over the years and then died before they could see it re explode and be reevaluated because uh this restoration for funeral parade of roses was released two months after the director's death fuck and I'm just like, damn, dude. Uh, it's just stuff and he, like in, that. In societies progress where it can actually engage with the content of the film, other <laughs> than it very specific. I'm sure in uh, different circles. regions is probably. I'm sure. More... I'm sure within certain circles it was very. I mean, obviously it got a restoration for a reason. If it yeah. was a bad film, people would have forgotten about it. Yeah, but it's, in my opinion, an amazing film, a yeah. beautiful film. I didn't know it was. I had no idea. I knew there was something edible about it cut going yeah. it. that's yeah. all i knew um which even then it's we'll get to that toward the end but sure it's a there's definitely playing with the idea of the cinema of gay trauma which is very progressive yeah there's a slant. because even to this day and I, again i've heard gay, gay people complain about even i do up up for a while there would be gay representation but they'd all fucking kill themselves at the end or something would happen you know, uh, even something like Brokeback. Have you seen Brokeback Mountain? Yeah. Okay. Like that movie. I love that. I, I haven't seen it in years. I really like that movie. Um, but again, it's like, here's the gay trauma movie. Get some awards. And and, and that's another issue of representation. People want to see positive representation, not just anything they can get. Although, you know, that's all you had for a while. Um, I don't know. Yeah, this but, is um, some of the best representation back in the day probably you're gonna get and it's yeah insane. it's in because it knows that by committing things to celluloid it is um changing them and, and representing them falsely and people bring all the associations they have with it which fortunately this movie because it's new wave by the way i think this is probably the first japanese new wave film i've seen yeah, it's a um, you know, it's kind of like uh the breathless of French New Wave, you know what I mean? Like it's like yeah. one of those top like five that people have seen of that genre. Yeah, and I'm not saying like I've been deep diving into Japanese New Wave, but I will say that um uh there is a bad side where like French folks try to say that Japanese New Wave is just ripping off of their ideas, which is complete bullshit. It's bullshit. As if ideas don't ebb and flow and just i don't know it's like the you french don't have to okay it, you don't have to compare it at all to french new wave no you don't and really new wave as an english term all it really means is just here's a crop of young and upcoming artists who want to play with the form yes and, and play exactly. with the market that's really all it means there's yeah. no other 
yes, there are common things like um, jump cuts, abruptly stopping music, you know, the guitarisms, nonlinear narrative. That's all part of it, but nobody owns that. And to say that you own jump cuts or nonlinear narrative is insane. That's yeah. ins- that's inherent to the that's medium fucking- and to storytelling. That's a French ass thing to do. Yeah, dude, that's so it. French. Fuck the French. All right. <laughs> We're anti French here at the podcast. Dude, overrated language. Sounds like you're bubbling, drowning. They b- have b- the weakest the Disney park. You know. Dude, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, But that's the thing. It's like watching this movie, it reminds me of how easy it is to be visually expressive and how interesting it is to convey thoughts through imagery and quick cuts and how boring a lot of films are shot these days. And it's it's done in a way where I think obviously a lot of films, they, they want a wider audience, wider distribution, more people watching it. I People, I think, there are people who will brush stuff off. Those people aren't reading subtitles anyway. But I do think you need to give people credit. Um, at least some people. As- especially now because images are such a part of our everyday life. Like okay, the idea of... Everywhere all at once, just one best picture. People can yeah, handle it. Yeah, that's a great example. I mean, and and that's... That's a very visually now, interesting film. Should, should it have one best picture? That's another question. But... um. It was one of my favorite films of the year, and it, it, the fact that that one, and that has become so mainstream, and the incredibly out there sci-fi ideas are so mainstream. Yes. Um, and I saw, Rick and I Morty, saw a I guy on TikTok today, an older guy, he was saying how he was, he was basically coming to terms with the fact that he was out of touch because he watched this movie after it got Best Picture win, and he was kind of just like... I didn't do it for me. I didn't really get it. And he did. But then he was talking about how when he was the age, he said he was the age that his father it was when Pulp Fiction came out and how much he, when he was younger, was big into Pulp Fiction and his dad just didn't get it. And then he said it was wild for him to have that same feeling about this movie. And he compared it to that. And, um, I'll never be like that. I will be, uh, you know, ripe for the changes. I'm but already an old man in certain ways, but you, I've been like that like, since you met me. Like, um, I will say I, I do feel like an old man in certain ways I didn't expect. Like uh, I, when I was at uh, Silver Dollar City yesterday, Parker pointed out to me all these college girls new trend. And it's like basically just wearing like a fanny pack over your shoulder like oh, this. Yeah. And. <clears throat> and I was like, well, why, why not just wear it around your waist? It's much better. And she's like, that's not the thing to do. And, uh, and it looks door here. And I was like, cause it was like spring break. And I was noticing all these college girls and like 50% of them all had that same thing. And I was like, damn, I, I don't even it's know. It's just easier than a purse and stuff. That one kind of makes sense. I know, but it's it just like, Chewbacca look, it just know? made me feel old as hell. And I was like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that's the event- bar is. Here's the thing. I've always felt out of touch with some aspects of culture, including youth culture of my own generation. So being an asshole curmudgeon, um, I don't need as much character growth into my old age because I'll always be that guy, I guess. I don't know. But it's just like... Fuck the French. What? I can see how, like, the the way this the style of this film could easily be digested today, uh, especially with it being better uh, not just the content obviously people are more open-minded yeah but the form as well sure um and even just the idea of it's it's so weird when the dude is dressed as a soldier and talking about the use of violence in protest which is an interesting topic and continues to today um yeah it it doesn't take a rocket science to be like oh this isn't something that's really happening in the narrative this is just in his head which i i think Honestly, if you walk in a movie theater, ninety percent of adult audience members are gonna get that. Yeah. They're not like, wait, did they go to a different room and dress up as a soldier? Like, <laughs> people aren't gonna think that. People are gonna yeah. get it. You would hope no. so. Yeah, it, and there's there's, there's there's some weirder artsy stuff, um, that you know may go over their heads. No, um, but it's just like, I I uh, now obviously I ma- I made my 
<clears throat> my first film before I ever saw this movie. But I was like, wow, I have uh, some visual identity that I, I definitely have with this movie identify with. And uh, it's just okay. the way like um, it doesn't care about the form or it'll just switch from narrative to behind the scenes documentary. And how oh, much I was of, thinking about that, how dear. much of that is actually staged and part of the movie and what what isn't which comes with more of the blurred lines gray area that's an overarching right. theme no I, I was i was thinking this movie like toward the beginning i'm like damn this miss this ripped off of patrician's guide to kino <laughs> the no, documentary but, uh, stuff I, you know i think that's part of it is these are young avant-garde filmmakers they have to rely on the tools they're giving and getting, giving insight to the creative process actually weirdly gives it emotional weight and it strips away some of the melodrama and makes you engage with it a bit deeper. Yeah. Cause there's comedy inserted into this, even during very dark scenes. Yes. Um, which works. It's very, to throw out the phrase Brechtian, it makes you engage more with the themes than it does with the story at a face value. Um, which really, if you take just the story at a face value about the cheating and Oedipus thing, it's not that complex or of a story at all. Um, it's not supposed to be. It's a vehicle for which these other things to come through. Yeah. And um, during some of these uh, behind the scenes sequences, when they're interviewing some of the actors and stuff, and uh, they, uh, some of the folks behind the camera they don't get it like uh they call it, you know first of all they call it be you're you're a gay boy and um and then some people find it perplexing that they're just willing to go on indefinitely as being a gay boy quote unquote why did you decide to become a gay boy yeah i don't so the guy asking the questions i didn't know if that was the director or not because i found it to be i feel like they might just be like a character honestly like the, yeah, the cameraman it yeah. almost seemed like that because it was very brusque questioning but i feel like the movie itself and the narrative it is a very tender portrait of yeah. this subculture yeah. so i almost thought it was supposed to be brusque it was supposed to be like your average journalist man on the street um and some of the questions they asked he, that was one thing he kept asking why did you decide to become a gay boy and then finally somebody said well i was born this way after like yeah. two or three interviews in that guy was just gay he wasn't even like uh yeah, yeah. um which i was honestly I almost breathed a sigh of relief literally i was almost like yeah finally somebody said it yeah. they get, but th that gets back to what i was saying about our terminology wasn't as mixed up. And honestly, the idea of being born gay, I think if you were gay, you understood that. But I think the idea of gay as a choice was certainly way more common. Um, we didn't have the science that we do. We have some scientific understanding of like, here are factors that actually increase the chance of uh, somebody being gay. Um, for example, actually the farther down in birth order, if you're second, third or fourth child, increasingly likely for whatever weird hormonal reason. That's why I might be more likely to be gay than my older brother, but my older brother is more conservative. So what's he hiding? We don't know. Okay. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. What would your brother think of this movie? The, he would hate it, dude. He can't do anything with subtitle. Like he wouldn't even get past that. He'd be like, Oh, it's it's subtitles. Don't want to watch it. It would be that immediately. I don't think my brother's gay, but it's really fun to think what if he was and what would his wife think of that. But uh, <laughs> the it's like I'm gonna gay. I'm gonna go kill deer now because I'm so gay. Anyway, sorry. Uh, it's funnier if you know my brother. He he's the way more arcane than me. Let's, let's just say that. But yeah, this movie in. Even so, the subjects of the documentary of the interview styles, they they seem confused and nervous as they would be. It, it's ballsy to go up and just be like, "Yes, I'm gay," or "Yes, I cross dress," or "I'm trans." Uh, I don't really know what the social norms were like in Tokyo, uh, Japan. In many ways, is a conservative society. I think in terms of gender roles, it's pretty conservative. You know, um, the pressure to be a housewife I think is greater than it is in a lot of our modern american girl boss culture uh 
which sometimes that's corporate feminism. It's like, yeah, be a fucking make money for the company. But that's another issue. Um, So I don't I have no idea. I don't have the historical context of what was going on in this. Uh, I, I think this was their economy was taking off before the eventual like three decade recession they've had. Um, because I, th- I think in the eighties was when it was really booming. Now there's also some stuff like what was the stuff with, it was almost like a parade or a demonstration of, was that supposed to be like the dangers of homosexuality or something? Cause it's all yeah, pre-AIDS. I, think it's, I mean, essentially I think that's what they were going. I think for it's what, and this is pre AIDS that grand, there were other STDs and, yeah. um, uh, obviously one thing i was thinking about there was it was toward the end of the movie during a sex scene there was a lot of cuts with nightclub um stuff because there is a hedonistic undercurrent to this movie not necessarily because of the nightclub scene alone it's that fusion of the avant-garde so bohemians hippies basically drug use um plus the nightclubs and that's the thing if i i was thinking about it i'm like you know i think one of the reason other than obvious like homophobia and just religious sentiment or lack thereof. Um, one of the reasons I guess back then being gay was perceived as so debaucherous is because you were forced underground, you were forced out of mainstream society. So you were pushed toward those other th- things in the same groups where those non mainstream things were such as drugs in nightclubs in that sort of scene, because you didn't really have the option of being like, a wholesome, you know, I'm just going to live with my family openly sort of Norman Rockwell life, which is very possible now. So you were pushed toward that. Also, um, drugs are awesome and do them kids. Yeah. And like drugs are pretty, yeah, it's pretty bad in Japan now. Like, uh, yeah. Weed is super illegal in Japan. That's one. I didn't know how it was back then. Cause they have weed in this movie. I don't and really I, know. I, I know that, and they had they show the Beatles during the weed smoking scene. Yeah, and I know the Beatles got kicked out of Japan because they brought weed, and they probably would have had their ass in prison if they weren't the Beatles. You know, um, so, to the point where I'm like, I would not, I would just not mess with it. Um, they probably just didn't realize how actually strict they were when they went over there. Yeah, but, no, um, sure. But the the one of the things I did find it funny obviously it's acting the way they shoot that weed smoking almost like that 70 show style going around the circle yeah dude is there were it was almost like an opium den there were people like barely awake puffing on it and stuff uh which yeah i, I uh yeah. kind of vindicated my my scene and movement because i do the exact same thing but the, before i ever watched this movie where it goes around in that circle and it gets weird and hazy um i mean that's what it's supposed to if you're doing the subjective pov of what it's like to be in a circle <laughs> passing a joint that's kind of it has to go in a circle and be hazy yeah, uh, but, although, just like, but you see people like lying like not able to get up like their muscles bones aren't working and stuff. yeah but i mean there you do see them do other drugs in the film too the i the whatever drops they, me- they mentioned drugs here i'm into google and i wrote them down they they gave the Japanese name of drugs that I had never heard of. Yeah. Um, I actually believe it or not, don't do a lot of drugs, despite my sentiment on this podcast. Uh yeah. Too bad Casher's not here. He could tell us, but <laughs> <laughs> he's busy. Um but I don't know. But it's just like um and they're all like taking off their clothes and having like possibly having group sex and just having fun smoking weed and stuff. It's I was Bohemian. Like, I- Makes no, me they, feel it, a little it, it, bit uh, better about all the grease shit in my movie. It's uh, Bohemian. Well, one of the things I saw, I think I was in Atlanta, an art exhibit at the museum there that I really liked, and it was about folk art, meaning, and basically the whole idea of it, and I guess you could call it thesis of it, was that a lot of your folk art, your untrained artists and you're sort of bohemian artists, those styles eventually get co-opted by the mainstream. So even if you're not part of the mainstream, you are important in the conversation. And this movie is a clear example of that. um, Important in the conversation that artists have between each other. I mean, hell you have 
like death grips knock on wood um you have death grips influencing i think like pharrell has has referenced death grips yeah. before loving them obviously kanye said oh i want to make an industrial rap album now <laughs> with Jesus." Yeah. Which I don't think that's again. I don't think that's ripping off. I think that's like saying it was no. They their money store was brought into the mainstream, and that well, not the mainstream, but like the if music you're a music scene. producer, you will have heard yes. Of it. And so, and that being so ahead of its time, just brought around those ideas of heavier, more industrial, more loud large sounds of course more aggressive and so yeah and so uh never do i listen to yeezus and i think oh it's just dripping off death Grip. no it's its no. own thing for sure like, absolutely it took it just took the idea of again industrial sounds in a metal album and that's a divisive album for people but that's um, just like that's i bet this went movie... full maga so we're allowed to talk about it <laughs> i bet this movie was so fucking cool dude you know, just oh, like yeah. show your friends like this movie's crazy. You know, yeah. hippies, drug use, that's, that's, sex, yeah. gay sex. You know, I, I was imagining watching this in a theater and some of the striking images. And there's one point where it asks the audience to applaud, um, which is another. It's playing <laughs> with the audience in the fourth wall by breaking it down. Uh, yeah, uh, like. Yeah. um and it quickly influenced people, uh, you know, like just like we said, like you know, the money store, if you are a mu music producer, you're going to see it just like this movie. If you're a filmmaker, you're going to see it because I was watching some of the scenes that are normally kind of um, would be normally kind of a uh, very serious subject matter, but they're sped up and set to that music. Even one has that classical music. And I was like, wow. I wonder if Stanley Kubrick was influenced by this for a clockwork orange. And then I went to the Wikipedia afterwards and it was in the first paragraph. And I was like, wow. All right. Uh, I got this shit on lock. Yeah. You know what and I mean? It, My again, cinematic brain, bro. That was, that was a good connection. Cause I saw that later, but, um, and again, though, I discordant music is not, nobody owns that. That's just knowing, I mean, you could do that in opera. It's not even limited to film. Um, you could do that in a number of things. So it, it, it's the idea that anybody owns these things. One thing that's interesting about that music, it was the first time I remember hearing it in the movie was in the very tender and beautiful sex scene um, between it was that black American GI who apparently had uh, killed some. Well, I think it might have been in Vietnam. They might have mentioned Vietnam later because and he might have been like on vacation sex tourism in japan they don't say because he has that photo of him with like the prisoners of war or whatever yeah. torturing them um it's supposed to be like look this outlanders i don't know exactly what's saying there for just um but that that might have been in vietnam because he looks like he's too young to be a world war ii veteran i don't think he was like on okinawa and then later showed up but 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 they anyway the point is they play and first of all that set scene is more explicit than a lot of what i see in hollywood now yeah, um, yeah. which I think they're more careful about those things because of me too, which, you know, they should be, um, they have now on movies. I don't know when this started. It may have started a long time ago. They have intimacy coordinators whose whole job is to make sure that consent and comfortability and everything is being coordinated, which is one of those things. Like, how do you even get that job? It's one of those, even like Foley artists. I'm like, how do you, what, what's the path to that specific are you like study sound engineering and you somehow fall into that? But then intimacy yes. coordinator, I'm like, I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, that's uh that's really funny to think about. I don't know. Like what what's your uh prerequisites there? Yeah, I wanna yeah. know. Or like but, a stunt uh, man. Dude, if you if you read up on stuntmen, they're they're always like, Yeah, you know, I try out for the seals and couldn't get in, and then I started underwater welding and now I'm a stunt man. Like they're just those <laughs> people who just like do a bunch of different probably have ADHD or just high. Anyway, point is. That music, let me get back to that. It's playing during that first sex scene, which is interesting because that's how I initially picked up on it. But then it plays again, like in fights, um, yeah. when they have the like cowboy sort of duel thing. It plays when they're like slap fighting almost, which is already like a parody, the kind of slap. Yeah, because it's, fight. I mean, really, it would be like homophobic hate crime, like violence, like trying to beat the shit out of gay people because you don't like them. Yeah, and it's played for laughs. 
in like a silly uh which also i think is purposeful because um a lot of people don't take men who are feminine or women or trans women or anything like that that seriously um i, I was reading i really need to see this movie i think it's a bit dated it's from the 90s it's called the celluloid closet and I, i've read about it and i did i dated a girl who was really into it um but she was uh not in the closet she was out of that but the we she was talking about that movie and about gay there were a lot of things in older movies that were coded as gay you know that yeah. like like a lot of effeminate men like the sissy who's like not quite masculine not like feminine and it's it's a poor representation and there's yeah. stuff like this and this this movie is very aware of those tropes and avoiding it this yeah. is weird getting and there's a lot of subjective POV of the queer characters themselves. They're not something, and that's the importance of that subjective POV because you identify with them because you're thrust into their subjectivity instead of being, look at these cross-dressers we're going to look at and gawk at as a heteronormative heterosexual audience. Right. And and one one just... point of the music, before I forget, I don't know if it was trying to pair the sensuality of sex with the sort of also animalistic impulse to fight. I don't know if it was intended to go that deep. My brain went there a little like, oh, maybe they're trying to say something about like sex and violence and being part of our base nature and being connected, you know, creation uh, creation of life and extinction of life. I don't know. But um, I, don't, I don't have anything more on that. It's just something I found interesting is that theme, almost circusy. There's a name to that music. I can't remember. Sure. Popped up through the movie. Anyway. Yeah, and it's just um, it's fascinating that they play these scenes for uh, to not be serious at all, and uh, to to me, it's commenting on that how it's like some people just brush off this kind of problem in society because they it doesn't affect them personally, and I don't know. Um, it affects them by destroying the institution of marriage. <laughs> Jesus. I will say, um, um, Jesus, that <laughs> was that, that was that too real to throw you off. Well, yeah, I should mention not... that our alma mater, our high school, is currently banning trans kids going to the bathroom they want, and also just a bunch of quote unquote woke CRT bullshit. Um, they don't want the term multiculturalism to be used. Which is insane because the fact that New York is a multicultural city is an you live in America, fact. you fucks. Yeah, no, well, uh, not in my America. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, my America would be full of anime waifus with big titties, but we can't all get what we want. <laughs> I like that. Uh, you know, the movie throws in experimental imagery here and there, but then there's a part where you you see just straight up crazy sequences and you're wondering you know what is what does this represent and then you realize oh it's an actual experimental film that this indie director is showing this group of people and i like that it like cuts to that and uh by the way the guy who makes experimental film is the best person in the movie because through him, it shows equality in the way that even trans folks can get filtered by art house cinema. <laughs> trans folks, you can be plebeian too. Yeah. Don't worry. Because they don't get it. They're like, I think it was neat. And granted, it's probably kind of pretentious. Um, yeah, no, that was, I even wrote there. I was like, was that a porn? Oh, no, that was an avant-garde film. And also, they make the guy so pretentious looking. He has an obvious fake beard. Yeah. Which at one point in a quick cut, it's like he accidentally tears off part of it. Yeah. And it shows his naked baby face. True self, yeah. Yeah, true self. And there's a lot of themes of mask in this movie. um, Because there's a whole art exhibit of masks. Um, but that almost is like commenting on gender identity in another way. Because we think of gender identity just in the terms of trans people. But... There's also gender identity in how you express your masculinity. I don't express my masculinity. Well, I don't have to have truck nuts on my car, first of all. <laughs> and it'd be really ridiculous because I drive a Kia. Um, but <laughs> I should do that, actually. I should get truck nuts. They're just scraping along the bottom of my Kia, like road on my Kia. Look how masculine I am, man. But um, th th there's things like that. And even, I think, the 
there's been this weird it's worse in the 2010s i think it's eased up beard culture it was like i don't it, one of those jokes where you walk into a guy a restaurant with a guy with a beard like this and you know the hamburger is going to be 25 dollars with no fries sort of thing and yeah. I, I almost think that's an overcompensation because men are software engineers and not lumberjacks, but they need to feel masculine. So they have to like grow big beards and style in a way. I've yeah. been treated, dude, I wear this A to hide like my fat down here and B because I'm actually treated more masculine and adult because when I have my beard, when I was living in a, and I was a few years younger, when I was living in a college town, I would be treated like a college kid, even though I was out of college. And then I grew this beard and I started to just be treated like a real adult. I swear to God. Yeah. It's a weird thing. Yeah, but that's how it is. So my, my point is, no matter who you are, your expression of your identity is important, and, um, which is something I always, I, I, I have, a, as you've referred to, a norm core sense of style. I'm very jeans and t-shirt. That's mainly just because I don't like the effort of like going <laughs> yeah. out and finding. No, it's really, it's just like, this will look good anywhere I go if I just wear like a, a dark gray t-shirt and jeans. Um, that's fine. Uh. And I don't like buying clothes or spending money on. But anyway, and I always like kind of thought the idea of like fashion or presenting yourself a certain way, spending a bunch of money on clothes is ridiculous. But because I always thought like, oh, you're expressing yourself via consumption, but you're actually expressing yourself via the effort you put to select those and stuff. I think this makes more sense in the idea of makeup because it, it's something I take for granted because I don't wear makeup because my skin is already flawless. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a physical effort. You hear women talk about makeup and there's a reason makeup tutorials are a huge section of YouTube and makeup yeah. is, is so damn expensive in such a big industry. It's like, it, you're really physically connecting with your body by physically painting things on your face. And, and there is a form of art to it. And we really see that when there's all these close ups of them putting on makeup meticulously and they have to do it meticulously if if they want to pass, if that's even the goal. Um, which it is, when they're, for, yeah, it is for some of them, not for I'm others. I'm saying it's very important. important to. It's a comfort to their identity and it how is. they're trying to be portrayed. It and, it reduces dysphoria, from what I understand. Yeah. Um, but it's it's something we take from for granted. I think for sure. it's just that oh, yeah. physical connection to your own body and your own portrayal by having to physically paint it on. Yeah, we you and I save thirty minutes a day at least. No, oh, at least. That. Yeah, dude. And I'm, you get the I, you get the folks who will do like an hour of makeup just to go sit in the dark at the movies. I'm like, what the fuck for? I didn't even yeah, I didn't even start moisturizing until I was like in my twenties. I was hey, like, oh, know, I should it, put lotion on my face. If that makes you feel more comfortable with yourself, by all means. I'm just saying I'm glad I personally don't have yeah. that need. And 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 by the way, some of you should wear makeup. I'm just no, I'm just putting, don't ever especially say that no, especially if you watch our podcast, you're probably a slob neck beard, and maybe maybe you should wear makeup. Don't okay. fucking talk about our fucking audience, dude. Jesus. No, the all all both of you are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. If you're, but, if but you're some not- some of you some of you should wear heavy, heavy makeup. Anyway, heavy. Um. So, Eddie, Eddie, main character, <laughs> main and character. With, with a Western name. Yeah, which I like. It's like, what's up, Eddie? I don't know. It's just cool. It's weird because it's so masculine, but also weirdly works. I guess because that soft vowel sound at the end is feminine. You know, like it could be Annie, Eddie. Sounds similar enough. Eddie through nonlinear uh filmmaking we learn has a troubled past and she is at a gay bar and there's a hierarchy at this gay bar and the main the main chick i guess or whatever like the the matron or not matron the what's the word din mother (laughs) din mother i don't know there's a better word for this hold on but she's uh she runs the place and basically in the and the um, the man she's with uh he's the boss and he yeah. deals drugs on the side and stuff like that and uh, he's also got a thing with Eddie so that's the main conflict is that he's seeing Eddie and then he's promising Eddie to make 
her, the maitre d' or whatever you want to call it, the den Not mother. The, ma- the maitre d'. I don't know. The madam. The madam. The madam. The madam. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the maitre the maitre d'. <laughs> that's not what I meant to say. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so that's that the main conflict. Uh, other than that, it's really just like, I don't know. Um, but is is that this movie is about 100 minutes long. That storyline, I don't even know if it's 20 minutes of this movie. Yeah, the whole thing is just really. It's a frame, but it's not even a frame because it's not around the movie. It's intercut non-linearly through the yeah room. which is so cool. it's like i just took my picture frame and like it, broke it up and threw it in there it really just lets you kind of soak up the environment and and these women and kind of that kind of scene and back in the day because yeah, i do like the sequences where you see the girls go to the mall and they piss in the men's urinal and the dude's like what the fuck just stuff little stuff like that and i don't know it's pretty I like the the comedy that they do have. Uh, yeah. And that's such an iconic shot, dude. Of yeah. just the backs of them peeing. Yeah. Up. It's awesome. Great. I'm un- unironically awesome shot. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it. Oh, shoot. What was I going to say? I do wonder if. I think it's done well by the end of the film because they're playing with the idea of gay trauma. Um. I don't think the film is trying to say that these adverse childhood experiences caused homosexuality. Um, but man, I don't know. Some people might no. hate that. I think it's more of, I don't know. They were already probably struggling with their sexuality, even though they were very young. So maybe at a subconscious level, of course, awakened, but, um, and being kind of emasculated by the way, it was like, well, I can be the man of the house. And she laughs at him. Uh, that which is so weird. That's one reason I don't want to be a parent. Because I like I, I asked my uh my sister in law was like, hey, are there any times you're hanging out with my niece and you just say something and you're like, well, that's a thousand bucks of therapy right there. Like I accidentally <laughs> and she was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, all the time. She was like, that's being a parent. Like, yeah, I feel like the, the and they're uh, good pa- good parent by the way. But yeah, it's just inevitable. You're like gonna make mistakes. Too much weight on my shoulders. Yeah, dude. <laughs> no, know. dude. And then, and then you're, you know, and then your kids hanging out with like, I don't know, stabbing their eyes out and stuff. Cause yeah, you're like, like dead and, <laughs> yeah, just shooting up. But yeah, uh, Eddie's dad left a long time ago and you see the burnt hole of the picture of where his face was throughout the whole movie. Constantly. And so once you get that at the end, it like hits hard, um, in a way, but, uh, so but she, not too hard. Yeah, exactly. She is a kid. Fucking stabs her mom and her lover because she can't handle it. Don't laugh at people, you know. I guess. can't handle it. Which do we learn? I'm trying to remember. Do we learn what happened? Does she go to like juvie or what happens? No, we don't. Uh, we, we don't know. See the consequences. She just gets away with it. Her. She maybe maybe she ran away after that. Who knows? Yeah, uh, could be. But um, and uh, I noticed just some of the way, like I was talking about how information and ideas are portrayed visually on screen in this movie. I feel like a lot of anime, uh, especially like eighties, nineties anime, kind of started to take from like that Japanese new wave style when like portraying interpersonal conflicts on screen and stuff like, especially Evangelion when it gets towards those later episodes and they're really having that inner conflict and fighting. And uh, it kind of uh, reminds me of some of the stylings of this movie, even no, like even having like some of the, the um, text titles, appear on titles. screen and yeah. stuff. And, and that, I mean, heck, well, text appearing on screen goes back forever. I know, but just like... I I don't know enough about Japanese cinema to trace the lineage of all that. I do think avant-garde stuff is easier to pull off in animation just because the audience is more willing to accept it because it's already not real. It's already animated. So I I think, obviously, a lot of people got filtered by Evangelion and the end of Evangelion. But they... Yeah, audiences are more willing to accept a dream sequence in an animated film, I think. Yeah, um, just your average mom and pop. Yeah, and then um, 
we get some repeat sequences too, like when she's in the car with the dude and uh his uh the maiden like sees them while she's on the side of the road in the car and uh I don't know. Um uh, No, that that's early in the film and then repeated at the end. Yeah. And then and then I felt dumb because I was like, oh, this is not linear narrative. Like I was kind of I mean, I knew that like the flashbacks to the kid, I knew that was and then I'm like, oh, I see what this movie's doing now. I feel dumb. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, the uh, the part where the lady, madam, or whatever, when she like basically kills herself, and she's like, they find her in her room, just like laying down and shit. And then there's the uh, the funeral for her, and the graves are like sinking into the water and stuff. And uh, she says, uh, Eddie says, like, I hope this whole country sinks. And then it cuts to, like, the cityscape shot. And I was like, damn, that's profound. And then, and, like, instead of taking that in, it was, like, the imagery and, like, what she said was, like, man, this makes me want to watch Tokyo get destroyed. I should watch Godzilla after this. Did you really think that? One of the guys in this movie was in a couple Godzilla movies. I know, but it's just, like, I was, like, I shouldn't be thinking about Godzilla at this time. Yeah, and I talk then, about, I, I thought about the Fukushima disaster, you asshole. Uh, <laughs> which was the inspiration for Shin Godzilla in 2016. I know, it's just, like... That's when I realized, well, maybe I'm not the best person to talk about the nuances of LGBT cinema, but you no, know, we're, whatever. we're definitely not. We're here. We're definitely not. Yeah, but no. we're here. And uh, we're allies, I think. That's a <laughs> Jim Jeffrey. Um, Jim Jeffrey's in his new special has a good joke. I like he, he's uh, he's like, you know, I consider myself an ally. Gay people don't, but I do or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, <laughs> Uh, the um uh jumping ahead though i just because i'm thinking about it like um when you do finally get that first of all um it's i don't know if you realize in the movie that she's actually seeing her own father until her character out of character talks about it to the camera and says, well, I don't agree with the incest. Yeah, and then, uh, then you're kind of like, well, what is this about? And yeah. I had already heard it was, uh, I kind of didn't get till the end. Again, I was stupid during this movie, that what was happening. I was like, oh, that's, oh, that's her That's dad. such oh. a fun, interesting way to address that, is like, not during the narrative, but like during this like, behind the scenes. In the footnotes. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, that's crazy as fuck uh, of a creative decision, but it works so well. And then, but like when you finally do get to that reveal, and you know it's coming, and he kills himself with the with the knife and all that, it it's badass to me because it just, is. It's so melodramatic. I know, but like, um, and and to psycho, be fair, if that coward. happened, if that happened to me, I'd probably kill myself too, with no questions asked. Yeah, like, fuck this. Like if you if you learn Parker, I've been sleeping mom, with no, which, I, is, I, weird, I, which is weird because you know your mom, but. If you figured out, no, I'm not saying if I was her, I'm saying if I was the dude who figured I'd been sleeping with my daughter this whole time. Oh, if Parker was your daughter, even though she's like four years younger than no, you, I'm saying, I'm like, I'm saying in a hypothetical, I've been sleeping with someone else. Okay, <laughs> I'd be in like my 40s or something, or okay, like early 50s. <laughs> I would probably kill myself too. I'd be, but... I'd be okay with it. <laughs> But that no, to me, it's like it's this um, very dramatic scene, and and it, for the most part, it's playing it straight, and then it just cuts to that guy who talks to the screen. He's just like, "Hey, that's pretty fucking crazy, huh?" <laughs> and like, it's, it were... it's just I, that to me makes the movie like it. Not it the does, movie. I, and it, I think it goes. I've been talking about this whole time. I think it. It's about being self-aware about the gay trauma thing. Yes, exactly. And, and also, for me at least, the whole idea of the Oedipal complex, I know, especially in modernist literature, it's very important. It shows up a lot. 
I think Freud has been roundly refuted by so much stuff. I can't take it seriously. I'm yeah. not going to read up more on it because I don't need to dedicate weeks of my life to understanding Freud when his his stuff has been disproven anyway, despite its influence on art. So so I, I wonder if it's making fun of that almost oversimplified view of sexuality that Freud had. I mean, it was more nuanced than a lot of people, but the sort of like, well, this happens. And if you're acting with these behaviors, you're stuck at this stage of sexual development. That's sort of over. Also, that guy really reminded me of the like Turner classic movies guy. What do you, you know what I'm talking about? That guy. Yeah, but also like you're still able to take the sequence seriously even after that guy appears. And that's what's interesting to me about it. But also it's like the whole movie that, that just connects back to earlier sequences where they play the sped up music and it's all silly and stuff during these series. Obviously this is more operatic and, and more grand and serious and trying to be like, Oh, look what society does this and that, you know, whatever. But like, to me, that just splicing that guy in there, it almost like it's almost the exact opposite. It almost like shits on the end of Psycho, where the guy comes in and he explains the madness behind Norman Bates, and because the audience is too stupid to understand. Oh yeah, because because across yeah, because the audience is too stupid, and then they're uh, and cross dressing is bad, and that he's he's Psycho because he's a cross dresser. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. I forgot about that. On I've seen obviously I've seen Psycho. That cross dressing aspect is so stupid. I tried to erase it from memory, despite yeah. being otherwise an impeccable film. Um, but yeah, but also there's the lens of like he's just wanting to be his mother. Yeah, sure, sure. So it's it's a little bit better than just be cross dressing guy crazy. But uh, it does feel like the exact opposite of that scene in Psycho, which really made me laugh uh, this time around. I didn't even uh, make that connection. But also, I mean, I, you... I thought about Psycho with the shower stuff. I, that guy, I didn't, because again, I forgot about it because it's so stupid. But also, it makes me think of uh, maybe what this director thinks of 60s American cinema, because you, we've talked about this on the cast before about how much more progressive filmmaking was in uh, internationally like we uh well we haven't talked about persona on the cast but this, this did remind me of persona a persona lot. mainly because this opens persona. with the sex there's a the hard dick at the beginning of persona which you don't see a lot of hard you don't see a lot of dicks in movies you definitely don't see a lot of hard dicks in movies um, yeah, and also like uh, we talked about La Dolce Vita, and you get that sequence at the end at the party with the debauchery, and there's like gay guys there and stuff. And, yeah, I just think and, and, it's cool. Um, and then you get to America, and Psychos is as crazy as you get, really. Um, yeah, and that's know. made by a British guy. Well, I mean, also Virginia Woolf and stuff like that. But like, really, it's like buttoned you up compare, yeah it, you think about by this point movie. we had had the graduate so stuff was starting to break out yeah we did have the graduate but you, you by the end of the 60s if, if this movie would have come out wide release in the u.s there would have been an uproar yeah no it even today you know even worse, today, people, possibly people. worse today yeah because we have all this reactionary because now everyone's doubling down not everyone because you know i don't want to get into heavy politics but you know there is no i get it also, you and I are really down. politically. I mean, if there's anything we shouldn't talk about more than LGBT themes, it's politics. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, we're both progressive people. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but yeah, no. What I'm what I'm saying, I'm just making fun of my own ignorance on issues. But no, people are people are doubling down. Um, which it, it's insane to me. I'm like, oh, this movie. It's such a cliche, but it, like this movie's more important than ever. But like this movie, I don't know if it's more important than ever. But I think it's an important movie now and important uh, to have. Unfortunately, it is because we got Florida being Florida. We got Arkansas. We got Arkansas being, and uh, now uh, where is it? Tennessee. Yeah, or, or so. Oklahoma that just been probably drag all. Of, it's it's multiple. It's multiple states. I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, we're getting drag country. shows banned. Like that's insane shit. And, yeah, any anywhere in front of, and like first of all, what nobody's, I don't know. It's it's such a broad legislation for such a narrow issue of a few libraries having drag queens, and then 
I don't know. Don't take your kid to the drag queen show if you don't want them to go to the drag queen reading. Yeah. So Just so be a parent, simple. you know? Yep. That's simple. I be will a- say I, I felt, I don't know, when I, that extended experimental sequence that the guy was showing them, I was like, yeah, this fucking rules. I love this shit. And then the way they portray that guy, I was like, damn, that's me. Fuck. Yeah, me. no, he's a pretentious film bro. This is yeah. a film bro. I like what I like. Before Certain the film imagery speaks came. to me. People can go fuck themselves. He was like, I have to be the visionary, the artist. This, <laughs> this is my projecting my, uh, again, I know I keep referencing stand-up. Patton Oswalt has a thing about directors it being such like a masculine, here's my big camera dick and every frame of painting and I'm going to create. Nah, <laughs> that there, there's that masculine. Art. And then, of course, like women are editors. So it's like women make the movie. Women are the ones who have to be like, oh, God, I have to cut this into ah, fuck. What did this guy do? What yeah, do I thanks, to- Marsha Lucas. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> Lucas is just I'm going to spray my creativity everywhere. And, and then Marsha is like, well, let me. Let me clean this up into something watchable. Yeah. Got a reference Star Wars here at the Harbor Boys. Yeah, we did. We did. Well, now that we've done that, I was thinking of uh, there, there's the undercutting of seriousness in this, but it's for a point of we're going to highlight the themes. It's not for a point of we just want a bunch of quips because every character has to be quipping at of all course. times which is plaguing modern Hollywood. And I, I think even general audiences are catching on to it being annoying. If, if it's every movie, you know, if <laughs> yeah. it's like that. every movie With that D and D movies getting good reviews, surprisingly, even though it looks overly quippy. Um, we'll still see it. Cause we've got the AMC. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Scott here, we've got the AMC stubs, a list. See We're three A-list movies a guys. week. We're not sponsored. The only thing I'm sponsoring is my book. Go check that out. But, uh, but that's the thing is like um we so yeah yeah go check out our book but even then it's like our book our, our did I write that no but, but uh, AMC, what, was I uh, was it like Stephen King and Cujo and I can't no, remember, no, I, remember I don't know why I said that, that. Was, I'm just saying like uh, or whatever so if you're wondering at home if we talk about some movie we saw in theaters and you're like, why did they pay to go see that? It was because we, we pay a flat fee a yeah. month and we go see whatever we want. We're, we're still Patricia. But even right? then, yeah, I saw, co- we saw cocaine bear in theaters. Yeah, but even then mid, I am still not going to go watch Shazam too. No, I'm still not give, seeing that. Could give two fucks about Shazam. It's still, it's still like a 15 minute drive to theater. I'm not doing it. Yeah. Like who gives a shit? But uh, yeah, anyway, that's a little thing about us. Um, Yeah. So I I definitely recommend everyone check this out, not just LGBT. Of course. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful Tinder movie. It's also comedic. It encapsulate, encapsulates multiple aspects of the human experience, including ones that certainly didn't get enough screen time and probably still don't. Especially towards the end of the uh, bohemian hippie era. Even if it's not the same as the U.S. culture, it's still that like I well, was obviously influenced by the U.S. culture from yeah. their music they were playing, and, and I mean it's like I said, the the hippies as as much as I crap on them, the world needs hippies and bohemians and maybe even a wook or two. You yeah, know? sometimes course. it takes all kinds to make the world, sure. and and honestly, sometimes you need again, you need that pretentious visionary who's going to make a bunch of wild stuff and then maybe an editor to come in and, you know, be the straight man. No pun intended. Yeah. Um, this movie, if you, it's, it's one of those movies you watch and you remember, Oh yeah, this is how fresh and interesting the visual medium of film can be. It and is. Then, and, and always has been, it just takes visionaries to do that. Cause I don't yeah. think this guy gave a fuck about making money. What's his name? Director. Yeah. I mean, he was just like, I'm going to make this film because this is something I'm interested in. And of course, part of, I'm going to assume it. Um, the great movie, beautiful. Def- definitely, again, like many movies I watch, I was like, man, I really, being gay in the 60s sounds lame. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to deal with everything they have to deal with. There are, there are parts of this movie I almost wish were in color. 
because it's so visually sumptuous otherwise like when they're yeah. in the night club and stuff um it, it was obviously a decision maybe they're more used to shooting in black and white maybe it's literally because the film stock was cheaper cheaper oh yeah it's 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 cheaper and it's like um okay well we're making this on a budget of like 75 cents so let's just film it in black and white yep that's how it was how it was until digital yep man and uh yeah i feel bad for that like off topic we're done with the movie basically but off topic it's like that era of switching over to digital and all those low budget cameras back then looked so bad and it's just i don't know oh yeah it looked like yeah. almost like a soap opera that or like it looked like a shitty like flip phone quality i don't know anyway uh or it was shitty but it's like it's just funny how you shoot low budget back then and it still looks visually crisp and impressive even in black and white but if you right shoot, versus in 99 if you shot low budget shoot low budget it it's gonna look shit. like yeah yeah so no, i get i get what you're saying yeah uh, anyway yeah that's funeral parade of roses next week on the harbor we're doing memories of murder bong joon ho i have not seen that one so uh i'm looking forward to it because normally on the harbor i'd pick movies that have stayed with me over the last decade or two uh but uh casher really loves this movie so we're gonna be going in we'll get out we're all part of this and exactly. he'll, he'll be yeah. back for that one hey if you like this give us a like give us a subscribe no I hate it's a call to action things. the call to actions work man it's i like hate Martin. it yeah i hate it too all right if you if you if you sat through this whole thing and you didn't subscribe, you know, yeah, do whatever the fuck you want. That's what I'm gonna say. You don't yeah. have to do any of that shit. I don't but care. also, Adrian, if we hit a thousand subscribers, Adrian might have a pizza party. And I, <laughs> yeah. I like. I will have a pizza party. Yeah, no, he's, said, he's been saying that for years. If any of his channels hit a thousand, we're That's having right. a pizza party. I have a pizza party. I'm Hell still yeah. holding it'll, out. It won't it be, be ready, wagyu either. beef. Okay. On that no, pizza. no, no. It'll be, it'll be, uh, it won't be chain pizza. It'll be good pizza. If you're in okay. Little Rock, go eat at uh, either uh, Vino's or Ariana's or Damn Goods. Those are my top three pizzas in the city of Little this Rock. Is the pizza cast now. Yeah, I'm, this is Barstool. Sports. If you've gotten this far and you live in Little Rock and you want to hang out and eat pizza with us, you can. Yeah, dude, drop or, drop a like and comment. Or if you're watching this and you're like, man, there's this obscure movie that no one's talked about that I can see. I want to be on this cast because I have something to say. Let me know. Hit me up. Yeah. I say that all the time on social media. Follow me. Friend me on Facebook, you know, cowboy, you know, we can hang out. Follow me at Scott K comedy on Instagram. Since we're doing this, (laughs) I need to post on there more. I haven't posted on there in like weeks. Yeah. Anyway. I don't know. Thanks for hanging people. We'll see you next time. Hack frauds. No, that's, I'm a hack fraud. No, no, no. We, we're 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 a channel for folks that uh, want an alternative to the hack frauds. Yeah, dude. Even though I like red layer media. Good night.